Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for making time this afternoon or, or this morning, depending on where you are, uh, to join us for our session today. Uh, my name is Arturo Nahosa, and with me today is Michael Rainey. And we're going to talk about advanced data modeling techniques uh, for Apache Cassandra. Um, so again, I apologize. I'm in my garage today, as I'm sure a lot of us are. I work from home still. So, uh, so please ignore the, the diapers. Yeah, so what, before we get going, a little bit about each of us, right? So uh, my name is Arturo, and I'm the, the principal product manager for Amazon Key Spaces here at AWS. Uh, I've been with AWS for about five years, and I, I own the, the product and business strategy for Key Spaces. Uh, before that, I was on the another non-relational service team, DynamoDB, uh, and you know worked a little bit on our security products as well. Michael? Hi, I'm Michael Rainey. I'm a specialist solution architect at AWS. I've been working with distributed systems for about 11 years now. And my primary focus at AWS is helping users with Cassandra and Amazon Key Spaces. Great. So as we get going here, um, before we get going, let's talk a little bit about the agenda for today. So first, we're going to talk about the importance of good data modeling, why developing uh, good data models that are scalable and very performant it, it is critical for developers building these massive global scale applications. Then we'll talk about some of the challenges of building good non-relational data models, especially for those folks coming to Cassandra from the first time, but with a, a relational background and something like you know, Postgres or Aurora or MySQL. Then Michael will talk about some of the key data modeling concepts he uses day in and day out with customers in the field, as well as some of the techniques he uses with customers to help them build these massively scale applications. Finally, we'll talk uh, about some of the tooling we use. We actually have a pretty exciting announcement in that part of the session today. And then we'll leave some time at the end for questions. So, you know, wh why is good data modeling important, right? You know, one of the very interesting things we saw in the recent Cassandra uh, report was that, you know, 34%, you know, Michael, slide. 34% of, <laughs> of practitioners currently <laughs> Cassandra said they sort of had problems, you know, driving Cassandra adoption within the organization due to a lack of Cassandra skills on the team, right? And a big part of that is knowing how to build these really massively scalable data models. And, you know, and why is that hard? Well, first and foremost, it, you know, it's a context shift, right? And if you are used to building relational data models and building data model, data model, Michael, slide. You get data models, right? It, it can be challenging. So, the, so in the parts of the data models, it really helps you build these massively performance, massively scaled applications. When you build a good data model that has really good performance, it's aligned with your with the query patterns. That helps you read and write data faster. As well as top of that, you you can build these very well distributed data models and more scalable as your traffic and data evolve over time. But there are challenges to these building these data models. First and foremost, it's a context shift from going from the relational data model to non-relational. Why? Well, in a relational world, you build your tables around entities. You know, for example, if you're building an e-commerce application, you might have a table for orders and for customers and, and for products. And when you need to do a query that cross all of this data, you use a join, right? And I can say, hey, you know, select from tables one, two, three, where they sort of share this common thing and bring me back all the information. Well, in non-relational worlds, it doesn't work quite the same way. Um, you really want to make sure your table schemas are are a reflecting of your actual query pattern. So in a single query, you can bring together all the information about products and customers and tables in, in a single command. You know, um, For example, you might have a heterogeneous table where you have all the information about products and customers and orders in one place um, because there are no queries there, right? You might have rows that, that are representing an order and a customer and, and, and something like that all in the single table. So it's it's a very fundamentally different way of sort of thinking about your schemas and your access patterns. So to talk about some of the fundamentals of data modeling, um, you know, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael to go through some of these concepts. Thanks, Otero. Yes, uh, thank you for outlining those challenges as well. I find that uh, most uh, of what, you know, being comfortable with these challenges and transitioning from relational to non-relational and NoSQL is really about pract gain gaining practical experience. Uh, what I'm gonna share in the next few slides here is some common Cassandra terminology, some constructs that are different in Cassandra than NoSQL. And then we're going to work on solutions that we use every day in the field to help customers with their Cassandra models. And then finally, we're going to go ahead and look at a new tool that we're developing to help modeling easier for developers and get that hands-on experience and practical knowledge 
with modeling, which is one of the key aspects to uh, doing things well with Cassandra. So at a high level, uh, Cassandra and NoSQL um, generally looks like what you would expect from a relational model. You have uh, a schema in, in Cassandra, it's a key space. And then you have tables, which are just collections of related data. They contain schema or constructs of similar types. So the server side validation of that data when you insert it. And then there's a rows, which is every row is a similar structure. In Cassandra, it's a little different. We'll get into that. But every row has a kind of sort of cell and, and the cell is a sort of the value of that row for that column. So what's different in NoSQL than relational? Well, one of the biggest differences is that NoSQL is distributed. So when you have your model, you got to think about how that data is distributed. And the best way to do that is to evenly distribute it for, for the, the data that's distributed over multiple physical hardware, but also distribute for the access so that the applications are accessing data in a randomized way. So your partitioning has to be built into your model. So your partitioning is done at scale. You're looking at more denormalized models, so storing and duplicating data, putting the, the cost more on the storage than the CPU. And then you're doing more modeling from a developer-centric way or application-centric way than based on designing a model for your entire organization. It's really a different way to have responsibility move from the DBA to the developer and own sort of that individual microservice or application. So let's get into some of the differences between Cassandra and, 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 and SQL or uh, uh, relational. That is, uh, you first off, you have a partition key, which is really critical to being successful in, in NoSQL. Most of the times when I see, you see issues with Cassandra's model, it's usually here with the partition key, right? So partition key is responsible for distributing the data and the access. You wanna choose something that has a high cardinality, this way that your data is distributed, but then also your data is accessed in a distributed way. So it's key point. There's a de definite fundamental difference between distribution of data and distributive access. Those are two different concerns. From a partition key, when you're querying, it's required to provide the partitioning key. Now, the partition key can be made of one or multiple columns. So when you go ahead and you start querying uh, your table, you're going to need to provide those columns. And both of those columns kind of represent or have additive properties to that cardinality that you choose. So uh, maybe customer is not that, uh, there's not that many values, but then customer co count combination provides you with a lot of values, which and means that most of your data is going to be distributed among those partitions. Now, the partition is sort of like a bucket. It contains many objects. There's many rows within, within a partition, and that partition is sorted. So you provide an optional clustering key, which sorts your, your data based on the columns. And if you have multiple clustering columns, there is a nested relationship there. So first column is sorted, then it's a hierarchy of, of storing multiple columns within each other. And that's where you start getting this wide row, uh, wide column uh, uh, sort of uh, construct. But it also allows you to do complex queries. You know, you want to be able to grab all the data you want in a single query. So the ability to add different sort keys and new indexes into your partition allows you to then go ahead and start doing more complex queries, not just equality uh, or not equal or inequalities, but then also range queries and be able to scan multiple rows, return multiple result sets, and really start uh, doing more complex things than just the key value lookups. So you go ahead, same with the select statement, you're gonna go ahead and select from a table, provide that partition key because it's required, but then you're gonna have to you know, identify different clustering keys. Now you don't need to provide them all, you just need to provide some of them, or really you don't have to provide, if you don't provide any of them, you'll return all the rows. But if you're, you start, you know, in this case, you know, providing an MDN will bring me into a set of rows related to that MDN. And then I can then go ahead and do a range query on that bill cycle so I can return a range of bills for that phone number within my customer and account. Non-key columns are, uh, uh, you know, there's not just uh, uh, something that you define as a structure, but they also have a particular purpose in Cassandra as well. I mean, it's important to validate that your rows and the schema is similar so that you can centralize and govern the, the data model for many different applications or many different APIs. 
But what you're able to do with non-key column is actually project data. So then you can only return a certain amount of fields. If I just want to return name and total charges, I can return a smaller result set. But additionally, you can also filter on those data. So you know, all, fil all filtering gets a bad rap in Cassandra, but really when you're doing it against a smaller data set, uh, which you've already gone on and, trigger and minimized the results with your partition key and your clustering key, allow filtering is a nice uh, feature to allow you to minimize that data set returned to your application. So what, you know, now that we've designed those constructs, now we want to go into a little bit of challenges that we see. Uh, obviously, we mentioned the partition uh, key and choosing the right key that's high cardinality. It's very important, but what you really have is this trade-off or this conflict between determining uh, a partition key and what should go in my clustering keys and how much data should I read in a per select or per query. So we have the, you know, we want to distribute our data over multiple partitions to, you know, improve the scale, the distribution and utilization of our hardware. But we also want to minimize the complexity of our client side application. We don't want to provide uh, we, multiple partition lookups. We want to do a single partition lookup, return all my data, let the database handle the retrieval of that information. We also want to go ahead and, you know, after we got our application working, the secondary sort of thing is like, all right, now let's make it more cost affordable, more cost, reduce cost and start taking that, you know, cost and start using it to other projects, right? So one of the ways we look at doing this is reducing the number of write operations, increasing the size of your row. And although, you know, you wanted to normalize your data and to normalize your model, look for places where you can sort of uh, normalize your data within a row or within a partition or within a column clustering key so that you can uh, do more with less. Uh, well, one of the fundamental things to get right with Cassandra is when you look at your results, you may think of it as rows and columns, and this looks like a common result set that I would get with a relational database. But in actuality, uh, your model looks more like this, and you can think about your model as a hierarchy, which, which really works out well with OLTP applications because a lot of the business functions that we model are actually hierarchies in themselves. So if you look at this, this is what the path the query needs to traverse to read that data. And if you think about that, it, it makes it a little bit more palatable to start to, you know, designing more complex queries within your clustering keys. So, but one thing to get right is that, you know, you want to provide, you know, a school in this, in this situation, you have a school that has multiple departments, departments have multiple teachers, teachers have multiple classes, classes have multiple semesters over time. And those semesters and classes have, uh, you know, a number of different students with, uh, you know, different uh, properties to those students. So let's say I want to determine what should I have as my partition key and one my clustering key and what can I do to help improve one or the other? Well, we kind of like to say it in terms of shifting left or shifting right. So shift left is a concept of moving your clustering key into your partition key. And when you do this, you're essentially naturally giving yourself more possible values, which is going to lead in better distribution of your data. So then you're evenly, more evenly distributed, your access is more random, uh, and your, the value you get out of your hardware is going to be exponentially greater, and the throughput that you get out of your cluster is going to be exponentially better. But we also have situations where we need to improve the query capabilities and reduce the complex logic in the client side to send, go ahead, order all these different partition lookups. So we want to go ahead and shift right. And when we shift right, now we're moving data from our partition key to our clustering column, right? Now what we've done is we have more relationships within this hierarchy. So if school is not accessed often or there are enough schools to provide even distribution, then I may want to keep all the departments, teachers, and classes, et cetera, within my clustering key. This way I can provide a lot of different metrics and aggregations of data on that clustering key uh, with a single query and really provide you know, consistent lookup latencies. So one of the challenges, like we've mentioned, is hotkey, right? We'll hear this a lot, and you'll get a lot of this with dealing with Cassandra. It's common across uh, mo most environments because it really, really a factor of how you model your data in terms of your understanding your business application. So when you have a distributed access, when you see more one server is getting more requests than the other, that server is then utilized more than others, and that means that it has different maybe performance characteristics. It may be a little bit slower. You know, it may be um, it, it, you may uh, have situations where 
uh, your, your entire you know, cluster is kind of uh, in, uh, based on a you know, single performance of this node because uh, transactions are dependent on each other. So what you want to do is not have it all skewed against one partition, but you want to go ahead and have provide even distribution across those clusters. So your number of requests per second is evenly distributed. And we find that there's essentially three different methods that you can do to help solve this problem and provide the, the, the least amount of code changes in solving that problem, right? So that's improving the cardinality of your model or your key by you know, inserting new fields into that cardinality and some other and advanced methods we'll get into a little bit later. Randomizing the access. A lot of times if you're having a set order of queries and you're gonna head and fire those order all at the same time, a lot of times those ordered queries or those ordered parameters can end up being hit on the same partition. So if you randomize that query set before you uh, go ahead and access your data, a lot of times that even distribution or uh, that queries can uh, provide a more random distribution against your cluster so you get better throughput. This is, and then the other option is to use time, right? So you plan out your queries over time. If the client doesn't need the subs, you know, the millisecond latency of Cassandra provides, and you can deal with seconds, then you know, rate limit and you know, be, do queue level loading or queue level querying to just go ahead and even out that distribution. And the benefits of this distribution is that you get a consistent utilization across your servers so that when you scale up and down, you know your performance is going to be consistent as well. So let's talk about uh, ways that we could add cardinality. What does it look like? So if we take this IoT use case, we're looking at you know uh, a customer account has many phone numbers, they're receiving uh, many messages per second, right? That's not really that big of a problem when it's only a few phone numbers or keys per account. But then when you have a business user and that may grow to millions and millions of, uh, of well, not millions, uh, maybe uh, thousands of, 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 of phone numbers per partition, and then all of the message that they're receiving, you could start getting into hotkey situations. What we want to do is shift left from your clustering columns, and now provide, uh, move that MDN uh, into the clustering key. Now you're, you're receiving, uh, you know, messages per partition on only a single MDN, which is going to ink distribute your data evenly. And then it's going to you know, uh, allow you greater throughput uh, overall for that account, because it is now based on several different uh, physical servers. Um, another, the other, another issue is reducing the number of partitions read. Now, this is the counter problem to now you know, creating more partitions for your key. Now you have all of these partitions, which you used to access with a single query. Now you need to access many different partitions to grab that data. And there's two essential methods to try to solve this. One is there's a server side way. So you go ahead and you know, do allow filtering, which is sort of an anti-pattern in Cassandra, or you do a CQL in operation, which is sort of an anti-pattern as you get to more uh, operands in your in statement. Uh, what happens is that you know your latencies increase and your availability drops because now you've involved a query that uh, goes and reaches multiple physical hosts, which then have to be then uh, you know have a higher chance of availability when you go across all of those hosts. And the other option is to do parallel requests from the client. Now this is uh, gets you and satisfies the throughput constraints um, uh, of your query, but there is an awful number of a lot of complexity to deal for, from the client side to go ahead and then wrap all of these statements together, uh, you know, do advanced things like pagination. Uh, it takes a lot of custom work to go ahead and do parallel requests from uh, to a multi-partition node. So really the answer is to really uh, reduce both of that problem and try to improve your clustering key and partition key uh, configuration so that your model can handle uh, sort of best of both worlds uh, in that situation. So let's take a look at a shift right. Now we're going to move a column into clustering keys. So if we take uh, a similar use case, but instead of an IoT use case, this is uh, looking up the customer bill. So this may happen once a month for a customer or account. Not that heavy of a throughput, even, even as the number of MDNs scale up. So we can actually keep that in the the, the partition key, but if we want to do aggregations across multiple MDNs across account, it makes more sense to put that into the clustering column where now I can do an aggregation across my entire account, grab all my data in a single query, 
not have to do a complex in operation, not have to do a complex uh, server uh, client side sort of uh, aggregation of that data. You simply have a simple query and it works well with your partition key. But there are often times where those, that conflict is very real and it's hard, very hard to avoid that situation. So the common practice, advanced modeling practice within Cassandra is to go ahead and shard or go ahead and bucket that uh, access. So sharding is to be artificially create more partitions uh, based on the values of another uh, set of data. So if you're inserting a clustering column with a phone number, you may want to shard on the area code and you can bucket all of the area codes in the same partition. But for all of your numbers, you get many area codes. That means you have many uh, um, uh, partitions for that customer account, but not as many partitions as you do phone numbers. So it's sort of the sliding scale that you have to trade off between partitioning and clustering, uh, clustering keys. So here's some common methods that you can use for sharding, which I find effective because you often have to change your sharding method based on the business and the business, the business requirements. So one is just essentially take a substring like we did before, take the area code of a phone number. There's more complex things like you know trimming and reversing the websites so that they're ordered in a way that you can uh, you know have better distribution based on that order. You can use a you know subsets of like an IP address or a device to get you know a, a fixed number of, of partitions, but based on uh, a piece of data that you're inserting. Sharding by range. So if you have a, a limit to the number of accounts you have in a in a in a in a, a number of phone numbers within an account, maybe the number of phone numbers divided by n shards, and now you have a shard a sharded range by n shards. So if you took a thousand MDNs, you sharded it by uh, you know twelve, then what you have is something like eighty three per range, which gives you a nice bucket to go ahead and uh, start. Uh, querying uh, buckets of partitions, but you're not as distributed and you're not querying you know, thousands of partitions to get your answer. Sharding by hash, this is another common method. Just take the hash code of a, of, a, a value and then bucket it modulo by some value, number of shards that you want. And then sharding by time. This is Sharding by time helps you more with distributing data, not as much as distributing access because usually you're always inserting the latest information anyway. So a lot of times uh, sharding by time will help you on the read side, but only if your, you know, your queries end up spanning, you know, multiple days or, or weeks, months, et cetera, like that. Um, both sharding by time and sharding by range are, are model partitioning models that continue to grow. So it continues to grow and you can create more shards as time goes on, which is also nice. All right. And third and final uh, option, we talked about hot keys. We talked about, you know, improving select or reducing partition keys. Now we just want to reduce, uh, we want to talk about uh, reducing cost. So take a look at this. We're gonna, you know, we'll look at the number of operations. Generally, we know Cassandra is write optimized, and we want to, you know, insert a lot of data. We don't care how many writes we do, but that's not necessarily true. A lot of times, the primary key can be the biggest component of your row, and that you're small, storing very many small rows. We find this all the time. So what we can do is start reducing the number of operations. We can reduce the size of the data stored uh, and the data access by essentially compressing down rows or making the, the row size larger and reducing the number of operations. We can also go ahead and start you know, taking uh, similar tables and start combining them together uh, in, a, in a way in a single row that manages sort of that entity relationship. And the way that we do this is we use Cassandra semi-structured types. So a lot of people think that Cassandra is just a fixed structure type that you don't have sort of ability to do add properties dynamically. That's not necessarily true. Cassandra supports semi-structured data types. So you can do map sets and lists. So you can have custom properties. You know, the good use case for this is a product catalog where many of the, uh, each product may have its own set of properties. That's a great use case for a map because you could store, you know, custom properties and all of the columns don't have to be the same for every row. So we can go ahead and start compressing data even within a row by using lists and sets, uh, storing nested collections within a row, and you could do contained statements against those collections, uh, as well as with maps and columns. So you filter them just as you would filter a non-key column, but this time you're going to do things like contains key or contains, uh, and using that allows filter predicate to go ahead and filter those uh, number of rows. 
So what, how does this work when we go ahead now? We want to shift right. We want to shrink the size of the rows. We go ahead and we look at your clustering columns and we say, all right, you have event type. This is, uh, you know, number of events is, uh, you know, sort of creating this large number of rows. We want to compress that into a small number of rows. So we go ahead and take that event type. We go ahead and shift right. We're going to move that into a map. And what happens is we, we reduce the size or the number of rows. We increase the size of the row. And now we have that event type predicated on the, the different properties within that map. So now you have the cardinality of your event type plus its custom field to now give you a lot, you know, a better map, which has a cre creates a larger size row and supports uh, more dynamic properties for each individual event. So the way that you query this, instead of doing a, a, a condition on the clustering columns, what you can just do is go ahead and do a condition on that map with the, the concatenation of the event type and the uh, event property. All right, so that was uh, just a high value overview. We have a ton of information that we're gathering here, uh, working with Cassandra users, making their models better. Um, and what I just in review, we have uh, different ways to handle performance and availability concerns with your model, distributing over multiple partitions, reducing the number of reads per, uh, sorry, reducing the number of reads or number of partitions to complete a read, and then reducing cost, looking at ways that you can uh, you know, reduce uh, cost by combining uh, write operations and denormalizing your data, creating relationships with semi-structured data types such as maps and lists. So I'm going to turn it back over to Arturo for some uh, developer tooling and how we can build more cadence and uh, experience practical experience with Cassandra modeling uh, with uh, our new tooling. Yeah, thank you, Michael. That, that was really good information. Hope everyone else found that valuable. I always learn something new whenever I listen to Michael talk about these data, advanced data modeling techniques. Um, you know, one of the things that we're really thinking about at, at AWS is how do we do more to empower developers, right? How do we make it easier for both, um, you know, an advanced Cassandra expert that's been working with Cassandra for 10 years to do more? Also, how do we make Cassandra more accessible? How do we make it easier for developers that are new to non-relational, new to open source technologies like Cassandra to get started? And uh, to that end, we're excited to announce today that we are uh, adding Apache Cassandra support and Amazon Keyspaces support uh, to the AWS NoSQL Workbench. And the NoSQL Workbench is a fantastic tool which really helps developers build much more scalable and performant data models. You can basically go in there and design and visualize the data models using a point and click interface. Um, after, before this thing came out, I've seen some, some just incredible spreadsheets and some really Excel Excel food that would that would blow your mind. This makes this so much easier. With the workbench now, you can basically you know import a schema from a from a cluster, start manipulating the data model to do some of the things that Michael showed you about shifting left and shifting right, and then you can even commit those resources right into your cluster or Amazon key spaces. So it's really really easy to use. It makes Cassandra much much easier uh, to work with. And, uh, and to actually give you a, a quick demo of that, I'm going to turn it back over to Michael to walk through how you can use the NoSQL Workbench uh, for a really easy use case. Awesome. Thank you. Really excited about this. And uh, what I'm going to show you is just a demo of the tool of a uh, you know, con you know, similar developer you know, experience and how developers go about using this Workbench, you know, improve productivity and agility. Uh, with working with Cassandra, you know that a lot of times with Cassandra, you know, make, making model changes, you got to create the, you know, got to create a, a table in the database. Uh, you, you can't really manipulate the data; it's hard to see it with data. So what this tool really helps you do is really go ahead, import, uh, share models, design, and then go ahead and commit that back into Cassandra and work in a very collaborative way. So this is what I'm going to go show: is Arturo sent me a model this morning. I'm going to go load it up into the NoSQL workbench. I'm going to do some modifications to that model, and then I'm going to simply commit it to Cassandra. So I'm going to jump over to the works the workbench. Um, can you see guys see the workbench? Everyone out there? Okay, I'm going to hope you do. Uh, we have the NoSQL workbench here, um, and. On the right-hand side, you can see that we, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side, we can see that we have our navigation pane where you can go ahead, come to the home screen, 
um, go ahead and choose your data model. This is where you can change the, the properties and, the, and the, the structure of your model. And then you can go ahead and visualize that. Visualize it with different data sets, uh, sample data sets that we provide as sample, a sample um, that you can enter in manually and share with your other teammates. So I could see coming into the dashboard that I have my Cassandra model already loaded in here. Um, and, a, a, and a model is essentially a workspace. A model contains multiple key spaces and, those key, and also those key spaces contain multiple tables. I can go ahead and port the model again, which uh, Arturo sent me this morning. and overwrite the existing model. And it's gonna take me right to the data modeling and visualize the, uh, the model so I can start manipulating this model. The model contains multiple key spaces, right? So I can go ahead and choose that key space. I can visualize my replication strategy and my key space settings, as well as a number of tables that are in that key space as well. So if I go ahead and click the customer table, I can then view all of the properties of that customer, customer its schema, the what makes a partition key, what makes clustering columns, uh, the types that are in those those for those uh, columns. I can change those uh, pretty quickly to to you know uh, change the type of that column, and then I can view my non-key columns. Does it contain any maps? Does it contain blobs, etc.? This is a very nice way to visualize this tool and even you know do things like change the order and descending order, ascending order of your clustering columns, so that you go ahead and understand that you can go uh, you know, query data and you're gonna get results in the order that you expect. After you've gone ahead and you know, changed your model, you can go ahead and visualize it. And that visualization is something that you probably noticed uh, from the slides. So you can export these images that it creates uh, and put them into your slides and then you can use them for your next presentation on Apache Cassandra, use it to send it to uh, internal or external uh, 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 people that you're working with on Cassandra uh, and then bring it to the next ApacheCon conference. Um, so let's say if I wanted to do uh, a shift left on uh, this, this table, I wanted to move the MDM to the partition key and demonstrate some of the advanced uh, tactics we use uh, in uh, schema modification. We can go ahead and go back to the data modeler. I'm gonna choose the customer table and I'm going to edit the table. I'm gonna go down to the partition key. I'm simply gonna enter in the MDN field, and then I'm gonna remove it from the clustering columns. And then I go ahead and save that data. And then I go ahead and can go visualize this data model. And now I see that uh, the MDN is now part of the primary key or the partition key part of the primary key. Um, and now the clustering key only contains the build cycle. Uh, the aggregate view of this, you can actually visualize all of the data within your, within your model. Um, and then you can even export that PNG image uh, so that you can put it into your you know, presentations or email it, et cetera. After you've done committing and visualizing your data, you're gonna wanna commit it to Cassandra. We commit it to Amazon Key Spaces. And for the sake of this demo, I'm gonna ahead and commit it to Amazon Key Spaces. And I'm gonna choose my SSL PEM. I'm gonna go ahead and commit that to Amazon Key Spaces, which is a serverless, uh, no uh, Cassandra compatible database. Um, and what happened is I need to disconnect from my... Go ahead and go ahead and commit that again. And then while it's committing it to key spaces, I'll go over and see my device services key spaces now came up. And now you'll see that the device and the tables are being created uh, in key spaces as the data is being committed uh, to, Cassandra, uh, to Cassandra here um, in key spaces. So um, we can go ahead and view this data. You can view the tables properties here. Um, you can turn on, uh, you know, point in time recovery or change your capacity settings after it's completed. Then you can go ahead and export that model, send it to your coworkers, and uh, you know, uh, start you know changing that model visually within the works the NoSQL workbench. Okay.
go ahead and get cool. started with this NoSQL Workbench. Uh, you can go ahead and download it from, uh, uh, or you know, send a, a request to see the preview uh, in the email, and that will put you in uh, a waiting list to then uh, be put on the waiting list for this preview, which you can then download um, and start playing around with your mo existing models. Yeah, so I'll kind of yeah, we do have clients available for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Uh, it's free to use. Uh, there's no additional cost to use the data modeler. And as Michael mentioned, we're extending extra early access to the preview to the attendees here at Apache Con today. Just send us an email to noSQLWB at Amazon.com. We can send you a link to download uh, the client uh, of your choice. Um, again, really excited to just give this tool to developers, help them get going with this on a little bit easier. And really appreciate everyone's time today uh, for joining the session. I think we've got a little bit of time left for questions. Uh, so we'll go ahead and, and let you guys ask any Q&A or gals. And I did see one question earlier from, from Georgia about uh, any use case to improve the modeling skills. One thing I'll point out is there are some baked in examples uh, into the NoSQL workbench that'll be available when it goes GA. So if you want to see examples to play around with a more uh, more complete data model, uh, they will be in there to help you sort of learn and, and up your game a little bit. Uh, and so Michael, one of the questions is, is there any modeling strategies for wide partitions in Cassandra? What do you recommend in those cases? Yeah, so this means a wide partition. This is meaning generally the case is that you have too much data in one partition. And that, that can cause issues on throughput. Like you're going to select a, a read, and now you have to read a lot of data from that partition. So you may want to go ahead and say, hey, I want to store this data over multiple partitions. This way I can access that data in parallel and reduce the time that it needs to, to grab all that information. Uh, generally, you can use a lot of those partitioning tricks, sharding tricks that you would uh, for, for distributing access. You can also use those same tricks to start distributing data across multiple partitions as well. And when you distribute your data over multiple partitions, that will increase, increase your throughput uh, when you go ahead and aggregate that data from multiple partitions. Well, if there are no other questions, I'm sure folks had a, a jam-packed afternoon today. So feel free to reach out to us on Twitter. You know, our Twitter handles are, are on the slides. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and again, anyone interested in uh, in downloading uh, or getting access to the preview of the workbench, please email uh, nosqlwb at amazon.com. Thank you again for your time this afternoon. Thank you. And any of those who uh, still have questions or want to have a conversation about uh, Cassandra, free, feels free, uh, feel free to ping me on this um, Apache Con session uh, software. I'll be hanging around for a while to take any more questions if you if you if you want to uh, start up a, a networking session. Okay, thank you. Bye.